All right, welcome to the Art and Hustle Gallery of Conversations. Welcome back here, Captain Schiavo, my lovely mentor teacher with your beautiful shirt that matches my pink hair. Well, you know, it's I, I think it does. I mean, this is a shirt I know you've never seen before. I, I have not. It. I got it way back in the in the in the the bunch of shirts. Uh, it reminds me of like a Monet like painting. Yeah, but you, it's also got a lot of purple. I don't know if you can yeah. see the purple. Got I can see the purple. purple. Yeah. 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 So yeah, now, my hair's look, we match. Uh, yeah, by sheer happenstance, coincidence, whatever. But see, know. great minds think alike. That's exactly, I mean. exactly. So, okay. So I thought I would speak to you today about when a, 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 an area, which of course is obviously very, very close to my heart, which is teaching and education. And I, I have, I used to use a methodology that they don't talk about per se in education schools mostly because <laughs> they don't either know what it is realize what it is or realize how important it is to keep kids from being bored out of their sneakers in a mm -hmm. classroom mm -hmm. and this is one of the biggest problems for students at any age i don't care if they're junior high school high school uh, university okay mm -hmm. university it's a little less of a problem because there it's more about intellection and a lot of the, the the students especially graduate students are bowled over when they get a professor who seems so eminently uh intellectual and you know mm -hmm. stuff, and, stuff and they're there for intention to be able to get their degree to move sure, on to sure, sure, sure. now i i had many of my many colleagues at the university who say to me my god you really know an awful lot about literature, but okay, fine, that's uh, that's great. But in order for me to make it relevant to students, in order for me to engage students, especially high school students at a school like CI, I mean, you know, one of the major goals, okay, with our students in Central Life who came to, from, from such varied backgrounds, mm -hmm. was to be able to get and keep butts in the seats on a daily basis, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, because stu students, man, you know, cutting was <laughs> de, cutting was de rigueur. I mean, kids cut classes like it was going out of style. Yeah, yeah. And uh, or they say, screw it, I'm not going to school at all. You know. I mean, yeah, you had like one day that was dedicated to cutting. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, but the good news was that not only would most of my students not cut my class, mm -hmm. what they would do is tell their friends about what was going on in my in my classes, and their friends would cut their classes to come to mine. Really? Yes, and it's funny, it's one of the great guilty secrets I can tell now I've been retired 22 years. <laughs> oh my God, that's awesome, secret. Yeah, and I said to them, okay, look, mm -hmm. this is totally wrong. It's totally unprofessional of me, but I feel your pain, <laughs> especially when I knew the teacher whose class they were cutting. Yeah. I, I, was, I would kind of roll my eyes and moan. <gasps> you know, you, you oh my God, that's so you funny. You bastard you, yeah. Secrets of CI. Yeah, so I said, well, look, I said, okay, uh, uh, usually what would happen too, if one of my students, if my students knew I might be having this, having certain kinds of discussions about a certain book, like, let's say, you know, Madame Bovary or whatever, if they thought they were, if they had enjoyed the first, first discussion or two, the first class or two on that book, they would say, oh yeah, you got to hear this. Okay. So, uh, which was great. So, but here's what the method was. Uh, and it's, uh, and of course I, it kind of was something natural for me, but I started when I started to read this 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 book, I said, "Oh my God, this is what I've been doing almost, you know, genetically." And it was a book. There's a it was a book written in the 16th century. It was 1528. It was a book by the Italian author Baldassare Castiglione. Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and in Italian, the title was called Il Cortigiano, which mm -hmm. means. The, and it was it really was the courtier. The, the it's called in English the book of the courtier, mm. and in it, it describes what he believed uh, a a a, a, a real, well rounded courtier and someone in the king's court, male, okay, mm -hmm. should be what the, the the attributes that courtier should have. Mm -hmm. They had to be you know, brave in war, but they also had to be, uh, know their, their etiquette. They had to be able to, to, uh, write poetry and write music and sing and know other languages. And they had to be extremely, you know, um, well-rounded. They needed to be, 
uh, edu well educated, the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. And from that book, I know what everybody knows about it, but they don't know about it. They know the term that came from it, and that is the epithet Renaissance man. Okay. Mm -hmm. So a Renaissance man, even today, is a great compliment. Okay, because it means that, okay, this is a person who's extremely well educated, uh, sophisticated, you know, world traveled, knows more than one language, mm -hmm. uh, has other kinds of attributes, you know, like can play an instrument, you know, can read music, I can play, you know, instrument, uh, stringed instruments, instruments, banjo, guitar, stuff like that. I can read mm -hmm. music. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I know few. I'm conversant with a few languages: Italian, French, Spanish, whatever. We're gonna have to get you to play and insert it in some of these videos. <laughs> oh no, no! I, it's funny. I know. I used to play. I used to play in school to mm. play, do stuff and students. And I think yeah. I sent you a picture where I, I was dressed up as a Country Willie. I, yes, I, I, yes, I, I remember I, that. Mm -hmm. I, got, I got I got white overalls on, and I got a guitar in my hand. And I got a floppy. Yeah, shirt yeah, I remember that. So what I'm saying is that, but but it's more than just the attributes. It's a, it really will, is defined in most books, most dictionaries, as what they would call studied nonchalance. That mm -hmm. somehow, you know, a person is doing whatever he or or she is doing, and they're doing it as as if it's just off the cuff, and uh, you know, totally ad lib, and mm -hmm. it's easy and breezy, and so forth and so on. And um, that's what I was good at, okay? That's what I was good at. So it meant when I walked in, uh, for example, I used to tell student teachers at the university level, you know, the absolute, there were a couple of absolute no-nos. And the first thing is, try, do not try to play like some of your, your academically oriented, you know, intellectual professors and stand behind a podium mm -hmm. podium and read your notes mm -hmm. no freaking way you don't that's, put your kids to sleep thank you but but worse than that i mean that's actually better than some of the high school teachers i used to know who would sit behind their desks <laughs> okay i know many teachers like that yes they probably don't remember their names <laughs> and that's why you don't remember their names you don't remember their names because they sat on their fat butts their fat lazy butts behind their yeah, desks yeah had uh, the a plan book in front of them or a notebook in front of and them. And then you can, the students feel that the teachers don't care, you know. Well, well yeah, duh. And they also feel mm -hmm. that, you know, they're like, they're dogging it. They're not, they're not working hard. Okay. No. And they're not really even intellectually invested or academically invested in their own course. I mean, mm -hmm. it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So, so here we are. I used to walk in and I had the whole, the whole thing down, if you recall. Yeah. Well, first you'd be standing by the door. Yeah, well, listen, I was just going to say that. I'll be outside by the door like a good good Protestant pastor, you know, uh, <laughs> meeting true. and greeting. Like, meeting you and are. Greeting. Yeah, Hello, you're like, how you oh, doing? hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Yeah. 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 yeah, and then, for example, like, let's say you had come to my class today mm -hmm. with that pink hair. You know I would have commented on it before you even walked in the door. Ms. Chung, what's up with the pink hair, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, was it a joke? Was it a prank? Somebody prank you? Did they do it in your sleep? I mean, what happened here? Right? <laughs> so then you'd walk in. So we'd be chatting. We'd be giggling. Yeah, I'll be yeah. laughing. I'd be like, yeah. ha ha. Okay. Yeah, and I would be doing that with as many of the kids as I could before the next the, the starting bell rang. So mm -hmm. then what I would do, I used to work at my, and that's another thing. My classroom was set up differently from almost every other class classroom. By set up, I mean, most of the, of the classes, they had their desks facing the door so when kids came yes. in the door i did it you did it opposite I did, it I did it the opposite what i did yeah, like was, our focus was you thank you because you know what was you know what the what was was if i had kept my desks the way most people did okay they either had them sideways facing a blackboard or mm -hmm. if in my room if i kept them facing the door there was a blackboard on that wall mm -hmm. the short wall but had, but they also had the clock up above it Exactly. That's what I was thinking, because the kids are just going to stare at the clock or the door. Yeah, and I'm thinking, no freaking way are they staring at the freaking clock. This is the door, one it's the door and the clock. That's what we're standing, staring at. And I, and I used to say, excuse me, I used to say, by the way, the bell to end class or the clock, those don't end the class. I end the class mm -hmm. and not you five minutes early packing your books. It's, you know, it's my way of the highway. Me, Captain, you swabbies. I say how I say jump. You say how high. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. that's the way it has to be. Now, 
and they got the message. Yeah. They got the message. All right, mm -hmm. So now the my now they're facing. They're actually facing the window. But, mm -hmm. the other, but the window, I had the blinds. I had the blinds down all the yeah. time. Yeah. If it was a sunny day, a rainy day, they would never know. They go, how come no one opened the windows? So, <laughs> so I said, okay, here's the deal. If it's a really nice sunny day. I'm going to be a little irritated because a I can't either because I can't go surfing. I can't go surfing. <laughs> or or I can't be riding my horse. It's I can't be fishing. Day. So yeah, it's a, or fishing. I can, you know, it's a beautiful day for me to engage in all the, the outdoor activities that I love. Yeah. Horse, my riding my horse, fishing on my boat, or going surfing. Okay, yep. that's number one. So you know what? So I don't get. I don't. So I don't get homicidal or suicidal. We're not. You can't look out that window. Plus, if it's really sunny, to ask your science teacher, he'll tell you it will. It could burn out your retinas and your <laughs> eyes. And you could go blind. Mm -hmm. I think, oh come on! I said, excuse me. Yeah. Talk to your science teacher. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Plus, if it's a crummy day, who cares what's outside the window? Yeah. It's raining or whatever. So now I've got them, and you're right. They're focusing on me. Mm -hmm. I'm not standing behind a podium, and mm -hmm. I'm not sitting behind a desk. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what are they? What am I doing? Okay, I'm moving around the room. Yeah, you're moving around. I'm moving around. I used to go from side to side. Plus, I used to go. I used to go forward and backward, uh, up and down the aisles. Yeah, which is good because it keeps us on our toes to not fall asleep because you would catch us. <laughs> yes. Also, you'd be writing <laughs> writing do dirty notes to each other. You couldn't do that. Okay. Not paying attention. I, but I had to be careful when I was a younger teacher because the girls, like you would have been trying to grab my butt as I walked down the aisle. And you, you think I'm sure they did, right? But yeah, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, I was going to say, I am not exaggerating. I am not kidding. They would try to grab my body as I wow. walked down the aisle. That's so I had to be hysterical. really careful. I had to be careful. Yeah. You know? Okay. I could tell you a story. In fact, I'm going to tell you a, dig a digressive story. Yeah. It's many years later. Do I have to cut this story out? No, this one, it's, it's okay. okay. Uh, so, so, and my, remember, I used to wear, and that's the other thing. Sometimes I'd wear costumes. Okay, so I would wear, you know, togas, or I'd dress up like Huckleberry Finn and my, you know, what my overalls and stuff. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but I, when I used to do the, the thing with my Greek Greek uh, plays and whatnot, uh, and Roman plays, I used to wear uh, what they call a keton and hymation. It was really kids would call it a toga, but that was really the Greek the Greek costume. Yeah, but it was all kind of flimsy. It was all made out of this white rayon -y, nylon -y kind of thing mm -hmm. and i you know because my legs were bare okay <laughs> i was usually barefoot okay because that's so, how oh no yeah, they had so, like those sandals the bit, so what what would happen was i mean i'm fairly scantily clad okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in fact one of the funny stories was they had a fire drill and i had to go out to the front of the whole the building dressed that way oh my a, god on a crisp fall day <gasps> Half, yeah, half the school was out there and they were howling. Okay. Oh howling. my God, that's just okay. funny. Yeah, it is funny. So now, of course, but so, but so, okay, let's, but I'm moving forward now, let's say, I don't know, 12 years. I'm in my friend's bar and, and I had a bar in Iceland. And this girl, one of the girls comes in who was a form student with her friends. And uh oh. Was, yeah. So now, but she's an adult and, you know, now she's in her. She's like, legal. She's not only legal, she was in like her late 20s at the time. Oh, okay. So, Anyway, she's getting liquored up, and we're chatting, and you know, having. It. But anyway, so, and she got around to her days when she was in my class, and says to me, "Oh, and I remember the days when you used to come in with your Greek costume on and do the, you know, do Oedipus Rex, you know." So, and, she, and then she starts to giggle. I said, "What's so funny?" She goes, "Well, you know, we used to take bets, you know, the girls and I, my friends and I, about what you were wearing underneath your, you know, Toga. Greek costume." Yeah, and so. <laughs> I said, "Oh, really? It's like you know, it's like the old joke about well, what does the what does the the Scotsman wear under his kilt? You know?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I said, "Well, I, I almost I was almost going to say her name. I no, I'm not going to do it." I said, "Well, <laughs> first of all, I don't know that I want to tell you, mm -hmm. but if you get drunk enough, maybe I might even consider showing you." <laughs> oh, that's that's a good little uh, insert, a flirt. Yeah, there. and of course she laughed. You know, and it was really it was great. But anyway, my point. Uh, though was that the you know the best teachers do stuff to engage kids to keep them your point uh, was that all your students flirted with you well yeah and i flirted back with them i mean i really did I, i'm not going to be honest with you you know i mean no. it wasn't going to say i mean back then you were this hot surfer so obviously all yeah i mean i was gonna i, I kind of yeah i kind of made that i was you know yeah i i hung in there for a number of years but anyway but my the thing about the spectator is 
mm-hmm. that it, it's when I used to walk into a classroom, it wasn't like I'm writing. It wasn't giving holy writ and saying, well, these are my notes and let me give you my notes and let me give you a list, a listing or let me No, I would go in and 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 students would some, sometimes think, oh, my God, it looks like he came in here. Mm-hmm. Uh, he must have been out last night, you know, uh, partying, whatever, and he didn't do his lesson. And, and he's like, you know, he's just doing it because, you know, he's doing it. Yeah. And uh, and, and of course, and I, I was always big on Socratic method and also on, on discussion. But the, the 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 image of the studied nonchalance, the sprezzatura, as they say in Italian, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. was something like it's a, it's like, oh, my God, this is easy for him. Mm. This is a, this is like, oh, you know, this is. This is who he is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is how he is. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, um, it, some entertainers and some actors can do that, and yeah. other, some other teachers can do that. Yeah. It's and I, I understood what I used to tell talk tell, talk to my students at the high, at the university level. Uh, I knew that some of them could never ever be able to do that because they just didn't have extroverted personalities to begin with yeah i mean it helps if you have an extroverted personality yeah. so that, which i did yeah. okay you also, did yeah a lot of also, yeah it also helps if you have a lot of personal self-confidence you know you yes can't. confidence that's a key one and then the other issue to be quite frank was mm-hmm. did i prepare my lessons did mm-hmm. i research did i do my due diligence absolutely because i couldn't have done it as often or as well as i used to do that had i not done so mm-hmm. okay I was my my notion uh, to uh, student teachers was hey look, you guys have to understand like I understood if you think I was going to go in front of a classroom five days a week, you know, uh, five periods a day for forty weeks, and have my pants my academic pants down around my ankles because I didn't prepare and mm-hmm. somebody some kid asked me questions I really couldn't answer adequately about literature or things that. I was supposed to be teaching them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's no way that was going to happen. My ego was too big and too fragile. No, not going to happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Okay, yeah, gonna yeah. Now, and there's so many teachers. I had a student teacher. I had more than one like this, but I had one in particular who we were doing crime and punishment. And it was at the stage where, like, first of all, you start, the, the student teacher watches you for a couple of weeks, mm-hmm. maybe. Then you say, okay, now you go up and you do your thing, okay? And I'm in the back of the room and I'm going to be observing. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take Critique notes. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm gonna, and then I'll tell you after the class what was good and what was not so good. Mm-hmm. So then, of course, when it gets a little more in, into it, you say, and you know, a lot of times teachers, the principals go, you can't ever leave the room. But I had a good principal who, had a, who understood that, especially with a guy like me, with a teacher like me if i didn't get out of that room the students mm-hmm. would never ever connect with or focus on that student teacher they'd always be looking around to the back of the room so, so that if they felt the teacher the student teacher didn't know what he was talking about they would look at you they'd look at me and yeah. that's not good see that's not good for a student teacher because all no distractions sudden, yes all of a sudden i'm casting way too big a shadow and um i just knew that i didn't want that to happen i wanted them to I wanted to, and a lot of times what I would do is I would go go outside the room and just stand so nobody could see me because the, they had glass windows and stuff. Mm-hmm. I'd make sure that I was on either side of the, of the doorway. Mm-hmm. I was close by. Okay? Yeah. Sometimes I wasn't. Sometimes, you know what, I'm going to go off and I'm going to get a cup of coffee or I'm going to mm-hmm. go down to the office and see what's in yeah. my mailbox. Yeah. My point was, it depended on the student teacher in question. Mm-hmm. So one day, I'll never forget it, it was, it was crime and punishment. The student teacher. I walk in and the guy is standing around like he's, you know, nonchalantly. Yeah, that's okay. That's part of the spreads of Torah, being nonchalant. But it wasn't studied. It was just, he was lazy. Mm-hmm. Hadn't done his preparation. Didn't know what he's talking about. And the, the, and the classroom conversation was aimless. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. I walked in. It took me, and this is any experienced teacher will tell you this. You walk into a, a room with a student teacher, and you can tell within thirty to sixty seconds whether something good has been happening, something worthwhile. You can feel the nothing. energy, right? Yeah, you can just yeah. I went in and I just said, "Hmm," uh, hmm. and I said to his, "I said, uh, do, do me a favor. 
take a seat in the back. I, I need to talk to the group here. So what do I do? I do what I always do. I whip them into shape instantly. I say, yeah. here's really the, here's the theme of this lesson. And let's pursue this. And I started asking them questions. Okay. And what about this? And what about that? And they said, what did you get out of this? What did, how did you feel about that? There was all of a sudden, I said, this, this has, this class had no structure. Yeah. There was no valuable learning going on. And mm. that, that was my bottom line. I would not tolerate that kind of crap in my classroom. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I had I had it out with him, man. That whole the rest at the at, at the school, I ripped him a new orifice in two or three different places. To the mm. point where he broke down in tears. Okay? <gasps> really? Absolutely, because mm -hmm. he knew, and he had been a former student of mine. Okay? <gasps> oh no! I, he knew. I said, I said this was t because, unacceptable cause, because it's also disrespectful. Well, yeah, but I mean, but but I felt I felt bad for him because he yeah. was bright and he had a bit of a personality. But I'm thinking, wait a second, there's mm -hmm. no freaking way. You're doing this to my students in my classroom. I mm -hmm. trusted you to take care of business and you didn't take care of business. <gasps> and you know wow. how to take care of business because you watched me mm -hmm. for a year when you were my, my student in an honors class. You watched me for you know the first half of your semester as a, as a student teacher. Don't yeah. tell me you don't know what you were doing wrong here. Oh, wow. Okay, but... Mm -hmm. And when, but when going back to the method of this, of this Spreza tour of being, having a studied nonchalance, like you, like, you know, you've done this all the time and it's easy and whatever. Uh, he, he could have done a little bit of it. I have to admit to be fair that he didn't have that kind of a real super extroverted personality. Mm -hmm. But I also think that this is one of the things that, that, uh, uh, principals and people who teach teachers don't emphasize okay uh the too much of it is still they, they still feel it's a little too i don't know what maybe i don't want to say informal well maybe informal maybe they feel this don't you know it's almost like the, the the difference between what you and i talk about that i've always said in a classroom i want to have conversations with yes students not discussions yes discussions are great discussions are fine and perfectly mm -hmm. legitimate but you know what mm -hmm. they're almost a little too formal mm -hmm. and, and if you're gonna have do express this spazzatore in your classroom mm -hmm. then it's got to be much more conversational yeah so that's yeah. part of that 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 studied nonchalance is that it's it's more conversational than it is something purely structured yes yes and, and academic and that, that that is also a similarity in my podcast because I realized that it's a gallery of conversations and I right. there have informal I don't want to interview I don't want to interview you sure. it's not fun like that I like the guests to also ask me questions because I like it to be a conversation where I can hear your stories you hear some of my stories and it becomes very you know casual like you know, you learn those lessons through all of these stories that we tell. And that's what you did in your classrooms. You told stories, which piqued our interest. Yeah, but Especially. also here's what happened with those stories. Mm -hmm. See, because of the nonchalant approach that I had, okay, the, the relaxed approach, students felt once they heard my stories, they said, oh, well, they would start, oh, I have, let, they would start telling me their stories. Yeah, and see, that's, this is, the, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, and that's the point of it. The yeah. point is all of a sudden now, they're telling their stories mm -hmm. in front of their classmates. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's related to what the, the topic, whatever the topic was I chose to discuss, what topics mm -hmm. I chose to discuss that day, yeah. Yeah. okay? It's coming out. It's, yes. and it's such so much more relevant, so mm -hmm. much more valuable and productive yep. and yep. important yeah, it, it's so hard to explain. I mean, try to sometimes I, I had one administrator who just wasn't getting it. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, he finally got it after a while after, you know, seeing me work a little bit and then hearing what other people are saying about my work. He was like, yeah, oh, yeah now I get it. OK, mm -hmm. but it took a little time okay? mm -hmm. because this was, a, this was a guy who was used to kind of, you know, standing in the front of the class and dispensing holy writ, you know, <laughs> putting up, putting notes on the board, <laughs> putting notes up on the board. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, 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 notes on the board. You write that. Take these. Put these in your notebook. Mm -hmm. I never did that. I never did that. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the nicest compliments I ever heard from a student. I actually I overheard it. I overheard it. Oh. Uh, I wasn't supposed to hear it. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it was near the end of the end of the school year. It was a senior in my honors class. In fact, mm -hmm. by the way, she was an art student. Oh, really? I don't know if you might even uh, after the. I'll give you her name after the. Okay. Uh, 
I don't want to, you know, I should really laud her because she's, she gave me this great compliment. And here's what it was. She's telling, telling, she's talking across the aisle. I'm at my front desk because I'm at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. I have to do all this paperwork and you got to get this, this route thing out. And, thing out. and it was really the classroom instruction port was over because I, they, I guess it was, they were, but I guess after that, they're going to take your finals or something. Mm -hmm. So, so she turns to her friend. I'll never forget it. I'm sitting in front of her. She turns to her left and I'm like between the, my desk was kind of between the aisles, the, the aisles of desk. And she says, you know what I've always liked about Mr. Cowell's class? And the girl says, well, 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 what? You know, he never, ever gave us worksheets. Mm. Worksheets, either in class or to take home. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, did you get worksheets in some of your classes? I Not don't remember, but I'm assuming so, because that's like one of the typical things that they give out. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, so a lot of teachers, in the, especially in certain disciplines, okay, mm -hmm. would give these worksheets. Yeah. Away from homework. Mm -hmm. And I never did that. Yeah. And they would do it in class. And they would do it in class. Well, so what does that mean when the teacher gives out a worksheet? The kids are there, you know, scribbling into their worksheets. And the teacher's like, you know, picking his nose or reading the times or mm -hmm. you know, uh, doing a lesson plan, whatever. And I'm thinking, well, that I don't. I always felt that's not what they're paying me for. Yeah, paying me f f to interact with kids, mm -hmm. to interact with young people about the content of my, of these English classes. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Now, um, toward the end of my career, everybody was really big, heavily into. Oh, let's do. We need to do group work, and kids have to learn. I mean, and there's an, there is an educational rationale for that and i did do some of it toward mm -hmm. the end because it was became very trendy and whatever and, ah, that was okay but um the fact of the matter is that i just felt that you know what the students as i used to tell student teachers i said here's the good news for all of you who are aspiring teachers and they would they'd listen they're shaking your head like they would do mm -hmm. say oh yeah okay i'm ready tell mm -hmm. me i said the good news is that there are no state or federal, county, or local laws that say you can't be boring in the classroom. <laughs> in other words, you can be as boring as you want. It's mm -hmm. not against the law. Mm -hmm. And the poor little, poor little students in there have to just suck it up. Yeah. Take it. Mm -hmm. And then, then you know, kids go off and go tell their parents, "Oh, I hate school." Or, I hate yeah. School, yeah. Or whatever. Now, I used to do a survey every year at the college level mm -hmm. okay and i would say to them remember i'm i'm teaching about teaching mm -hmm. and in the first my, my 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 classes were three hours long three hours once a week for methods english methods three hours three four. hours wow well yeah but it's only once a week okay but still okay, so, sit there for yeah. three hours right well but that's my point <laughs> for three hours what was it it was the Captain Willie show. For yeah, I know, hours. but that can you imagine if it was a boring class for three hours? Like that's exactly what I'm trying to tell you. Mm -hmm. They they would come in and go, "What is Captain Willie gonna say or do?" To yeah, me? it's literally a show. Your performance. It's a show. It's a, yeah because art. That's, when your art was teaching. Yeah, and the fa and that's another thing I'd mm -hmm. say to them, and this is where you know this is where I made my bones as an instructor of, of future instructors. Don't think of your class your students don't think of, of them as a, a class don't think of them as students think of them as an audience mm -hmm. and you're the entertainer mm -hmm. okay trying to make it pop and you got to make it pop for three hours now there are teachers i yeah. know professors who will would sit behind their desk or stand in front of a podium for three mm -hmm. hours mm -hmm. oh my god it wasn't popping no. And they said, well, I'm just giving you <laughs> such, yeah, I'm giving you such important information. Yeah. How could you not be interested? How could yeah. you not take notes? How mm -hmm. could you not just go, oh my God, gen how could you not genuflect in front of my master? How long did you um, teach teachers? Uh, about on and off for 17 years. Wow. Okay. Yeah, Stony Brook was 17. I started in Stony Brook at 1990. Seven. I taught mm -hmm. an English methods class, a graduate class. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so those I could do while I was still working at Central Isaac because, um, you know, it was after school. 
Mm -hmm. I couldn't do seminar, although at the time the director wanted me to do seminar, but I couldn't because, um, you know, I was still working. So it would be mm -hmm. like double dipping. Because why? Well, yeah. I have to go in and observe student teachers in their classrooms during the day, which of course would be Ill illegal, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, so if I was working at a high school. So um, so then when I when I finally retired, I could do both. I could do, I, sometimes I did English methods and seminar. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I did one or the other, whatever the university needed based upon their enrollment that particular mm -hmm. semester. But what I was saying was, I mean, but you know, a lot of these professors said, okay, I expect you to genuflect at the magnificence of my massive intellect and, and scholarship and whatever, okay? And they would sometimes wouldn't even crack a smile. Mm. Now, that wasn't for all of them. I mean, some, yeah. I mean, some are better than others, but my point is that, that uh, there had to be some kind of a payoff. Yeah. And the other part of it was, yes, I could be entertaining, but I don't think anybody of my former students, and I know it's true because they're still in touch with me, they all knew this guy knows what he's talking about. Yeah. He, he's yeah. been to the mountain. He's seen the promised land educationally and instructionally. You know what? I'm learning a lot from this guy. Yeah. And, and life in general, because once you spread, you know, what the curriculum or whatever book you're trying to give us lessons on then you apply it to your life as well and so it's those exchanging of stories and connections and conversations that make us remember what you said too absolutely you know absolutely. i mean there are students today your age who remember things i said in the classroom today yeah i mean like i catch myself every so often either saying something that you had taught me or doing something that you had taught me and i'll remember it you know like nobody's perfect or you know or some other words and quotes that you you told me well no i i, I mentioned that i also i did a survey every year i didn't tell you what the survey was here's the survey mm -hmm. i would go in let's say i had a methods class of 20 students 25 students at the university and in that first three hours, someplace along the lines, I would say, okay, look, let me ask you a question. In grades seven through 12, which is six years of second, because I remember I t we were teaching at Stony Brook, we were teaching only secondary level student teachers from grade who were going to teach grades seven through 12. Later on, they said you could do six, that they changed the law or something. But, I, but, but let's assume six years, seven through 12. I said, in those six years, you probably had at least five teachers every day, maybe more, okay, for all these different subjects. How many of you had at least one memorable, truly outstanding teacher that you mm -hmm. remember to this day? Mm -hmm. I might get out of 20, mm -hmm. I get a few hands. Mm -hmm. A few hands. A few hands, that's it. A that's few. sad. That's okay. sad. Okay. Then I said, well, Okay, how many of you had two memorable teachers? Mm -hmm. I might get one or two hands. Oh no, the hands are going down. Yeah. How many of you had a, had three? No hands. I yeah. had I had a few, so I'm lucky. Yeah, you are lucky. And I'm I lucky. used to say that to them. I used to say, Wow, you had two? My yeah. God, how lucky you were. Yeah, okay. like I think I I think I can remember at least five teachers that were memorable to me. Yeah, but well, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. What were this? What were this subject? What were the subject disciplines? Uh oh. <laughs> well, uh, um, don't, no a names. Lot them, just... A lot of there's a lot of them that's art. I, well, I was going to say that because you're an artist, and now you yeah, have to so, art. Yeah, so yeah, it's got to be things that I'm interested in. So it would be like three art teachers that were three or four art teachers that were memorable. Maybe my tennis coach that's memorable. My volleyball coach. Um, my no, yearbook that's, editor, like that's supervisor. more. Than, that's more. That's more than five. Yeah, so I had like a lot that, because I was into all of those things. So then those. Okay, no, but I'm talking. Okay, look, no, wait, no, let's clarify. Oh, you're talking just teacher wise. I mean, just in classrooms, classrooms. Okay. Because once you once you're dealing with advisors and coaches, mm, it's a different so that's world. not the same. I'm talking about a classroom teacher. So teachers, okay. So it's mostly art. Okay. And you. Okay. And then maybe some other ones, other subjects. Maybe a couple more other subjects, but not many more. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I had classes where I've had students say to me, and these are adults now, and then when I'm not talking about, you know, kids, 15 year old, mm -hmm. you know, they're adults. And I said, hey, I didn't have any outstanding teachers. Yeah. Any, none. Yeah. yeah. None that were memorable. Yeah, like my yeah. friend says he's not, he can't remember anybody that he remembers as teachers. That's right. That's right. That influential to him. And, and if I asked you, I, I, I already have it. Don't say anything. <laughs> but if I said to you, 
Okay, so who did you have when you were in the 10th grade? Who did you have for English or who did you have for history? And you say to me, gee, I can't remember. I that can't tells remember. me all I need to know. Yeah, I don't remember. Well, that says to me that particular instructor was, was okay, uh, uh, they, they did a job, but as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. they didn't do the job, mm -hmm. okay? In other words, you should re and, and look and all the greatest religious icons were considered mm -hmm. teachers whether it's christ or buddha mm -hmm. muhammad whatever they were memorable people they were they people were absorbed and engaged by their 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 message yep. they they had something about them that was they had they were charismatic in some way yep. mm -hmm. and, and and by the way spetsatora and and charisma or they're kind of related. I don't believe that they're the same, but they're kind of related. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had, I think I had one or two teachers who I thought were really charismatic. And I really yeah. said, you know what? Wow. Yeah. They're really special, you know? Um, but um, the fact is, I said, uh, they, so many people come out of, out of secondary schools with, they're just like, my God, it was, it was a, a, a null experience, a dull or a dull experience, or just a, a, a they basically were, they were basically were like I was. Mm -hmm. I was self-taught in high school because I, I was a big reader. I read a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I did have two or three. I had to, actually two. I had really. I had one teacher I thought was really outstanding in terms of. Yeah, see, even that. I I liked I liked his class, mm -hmm. but he 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 was he was in he was had a great personality. He was engaging. Okay, mm -hmm. and he was, mm -hmm. he was right. But the one who was my most significant contributor to my education was my high school librarian. Yes. And actually, she, I discovered her and she discovered me when I was in the seventh grade. Mm. And for six years, she was my... That's awesome. She was like your mentor, too. She was my mentor. She was your my... hero, maybe? She was, like, she was my guru. But you know what the thing was, too? And she never... But that's just funny. And funny. She was not a classroom teacher. So now the thing about Spletsatura was less important for her. Mm -hmm. she could, as a librarian, she had to be be quiet. Not, yeah, and be behind the, the desk. You're right. But she would almost speak to me in a whisper. But what she did was she gave me humongous credit for being a, 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 a serious reader who mm -hmm. read widely as well as deeply. Mm -hmm. And then she would talked to me and she gave me humongous humongous credit and respect and i felt it for my having a brain and when i spoke to her she gave me credit for saying things that were smart mm -hmm. and uh, indicated that i understood the books that she was allowing me to read because i used to read all the brand new books again yeah she was, she was special most students though they really get that but for example I don't know if I told you, I, my, I, my first big award, and I'm very proud to brag about it. Um, one of my, I had a, 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 a one of the val valedictorians from Central Isaac, mm -hmm. uh, a, a very, very pretty, very tall uh, African-American girl, okay, mm -hmm. brilliant girl. So, in fact, where's the picture? I have to, I have to find the picture. And send it to you to put it into the. Uh, you have to see it. Mm -hmm. It's hysterical. When you look at it, it's hysterical. Why? She was six foot, easily six foot. Okay. And you are. And well, five foot six. And then wait, the president of the university. What the hell is his name? Frank something or other. At the time, he was mm -hmm. long retired. And then her, her teacher in her like the universities are made up of colleges. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think she was in the College of uh, Labor and something labor relations and something whatever it was like a business part of that and then they have a college for you know uh, liberal arts and a college for this way so they had i think they had uh 22 valedictorians and salutatorians among the colleges and mm -hmm. that year it was 1986. Mm -hmm. but anyway her teacher or whatever the all three of them were six foot to six foot four or five wow i'm standing among them, <laughs> I look like a midget. Plus, I'm wearing a tan suit, mm -hmm. like a light tan suit, and they were wearing like dark. I so look you, at you that. were like disappearing. 
Yeah, and I look at that picture, and the look on my face is, you don't see me smiling. I am so stunned by being there. They're taking this picture with, I have a, a plaque in my hand or something, or the certificate. And what it was, was, here's what Cornell did that year. It, to my point. They asked their top students in their, in their colleges to say, look, we want to do something for uh, classroom teachers mm -hmm. of any grade, okay? And so who, what teacher in your school years before college mm -hmm. made the most significant contribution to your education? Mm -hmm. Now catch this. They came up with 22 teachers mm -hmm. from across the country. Wow. From across the country. Across the country. Across the country. I was one of them, thank mm -hmm. goodness. I was one of them, much to my shock, surprise, gratitude, whatever. Yeah. And what happened was that, uh, and we we made it to the, what Cornell did made it to the New York Times. I was quoted in the New York Times about teaching and this and the other thing. I have the quotes in place. And, um, but what was fasc fascinating was the fact that uh, when we got all got together mm -hmm. and uh, there was, we had meetings with, you know, college professors and they were giving us a tour. And we had a couple of discussion groups and among them were students who were not among the top students in their, definite, in their colleges. But more than one came out and said, you know what? We never had an outstanding, memorable teacher that made a significant contribution to our education. They were, they were, uh, they didn't say it this way, but I know what they were saying. Mm -hmm. The teachers that they had were what I would call, quote, time-serving mediocrities, unquote. Mm. <laughs> okay? I mean, I can be just as brutal as anybody else about yeah. the nature of teachers. Yeah. Even though I've known, and you have known, outstanding, caring, sensitive, wonderful instructors, mm -hmm. wonderful teachers. Don't get me wrong. I'm not slamming the whole profession. Yeah. But the thing about mediocrity is, is that when you talk about mediocrity, you're talking about the majority. The majority yeah. Yeah. of people in any profession are going to be mediocre. Yeah. Some people... Uh, <laughs> I remember I had, I had a teacher who said, well, you know, the cre cream rises to the top. And my comment was, yeah, well, so does pond scum. <laughs> I think I was a high school student this year. Yeah. What, yeah. what an uppity high school kid it was. Well, so does pond scum, you know. That <laughs> the top, so. Scavo, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> shut up and, and, and leave the room. <laughs> but, um, but it's true, I, I think. And I, I think because I've always liked kids like young people mm -hmm. okay? because mm -hmm. and that's partly selfish because i've never grown up linda you know that yeah so i know it's also if i didn't like young people i would not like myself because because you're know, you're forever young uh, well yeah i told you i might probably uh, i'm still 17 you know yeah yeah so so uh uh but i mean you know I'm, i think i'm 17 now in, in a wise way not a silly immature yeah way. yeah but i uh this all comes down to uh, a method that tends to engage students and work for both the student and the students and the instructor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. and I really appreciate you chatting about this because I feel like this is very valuable information that we are able to chat about and put these on the podcast to be able to give it out free. This is free advice to yeah. people and students and all of your lessons, honestly, that you've taught in class help beyond the classroom and I, I again i also think that too with your with your two kids that you have to quiz them a little bit or say hey look you know what teachers do you have, have this year and you know what are they teaching and do you like them mm -hmm. uh, and if you do why do you think you like them you know is it is they make you laugh uh, you know uh you know I, I mean you know what's the story with them how body would you like them and why do you feel that they're worth your time mm -hmm. it's the other thing why do you feel they're worth your time? See, this is the other issue, is that too many adults don't believe that kids should have to, I don't know what, have the opinion that their time is being wasted, mm -hmm. you see? And, and, ki and kids are very blunt of how they feel. I mean, my daughter came home and was already like, I don't like this teacher. And did she say why? 
he's like she's mean in the way she talks or <laughs> and also another one would be like um i don't you know the way she looks and she keeps yelling at us and this and that and she's like i don't really like them like i was like yeah. oh no and, and you know and i often said this too when students um when you have this sprezzatura if you're lucky when you have this um conf and part of it too is it, it really comes down to confidence too mm -hmm. you, you got you got so uh, uh, people who have this this uh characteristic this attribute of this nonchalance and whatever mm -hmm. it indicates really they've got a lot of self-confidence yes okay? yeah and of course and exudes. Of the, yeah that they do it they exude it and the kids feel it and also when they f have that confidence they don't feel the need to uh uh admonish and abuse and criticize students they go you know what mm -hmm. i'm a certain kind of pr these students should realize hey i'm a person that is could be in, and will be accessible to them if they need to ask me a question mm -hmm. if they need my help uh, you know, learning a new problem or yeah. understanding a new paragraph in a, in a new, new novel mm -hmm. uh, or if they need some help even personally if they want to come yeah. to me and by the way I never, ever, and I had a caution, one former colleague of mine in particular, who wanted to engage herself into people's kids' lives. I said, no, 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 no. Oh. If someone wants, if a student wants your mm -hmm. assistance or wants something above the normal classroom experience or academic experience, mm -hmm. they will make a decision to go to you. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't go make a point of, make a, a trying to connect with them mm -hmm. they have to want to come to me because yeah. first of all if i get I'm dealing with 100 to 150 kids a day anyway okay mm -hmm. time is tough time is time is short so if students feel that i'm a, um, approachable and accessible i'm happy to do what i can do mm -hmm. but i'm not going to go after them because i need a friend you know what i mean yeah yeah so um so I think that's that's part of it. But I think that that when you tell me when your kids are saying, "Well, this one's mean," this one, those t tell me that those teachers are lacking some a little bit of some self confidence, and also they believe that somehow they have to express the fact that they're authority figures. Yeah. Or it's um, I can speak to you this way because I'm the adult. I have the authority. The state yeah. gives me the authority. The school district gives me the authority. I can be as as indifferent or as mean to you as I feel is necessary to get my job done. Yeah, and it's day one. This is that yeah. this is this yeah. is day one her coming home tell me this. I was like, and, oh no. And, and you know, that's another thing I used to hear. Mm -hmm. I used to hear from instructors to you know, young te aspiring teachers. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, and you shouldn't sm don't smile until don't smile until Christmas. <laughs> yeah, stupid stupidity like that. And I'm thinking not only <clears throat> did I smile the very first day of class, yeah. I used to make them laugh the very first day of class. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and of course, that's it, because what they're also afraid of, and when you have this this attribute of well, that's a Torah, this 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 self confidence that's mm -hmm. along goes along with it, is you're not worried about kids giving you a hard time. You see, and they're gonna get, and the more <laughs> the more affable. And this is something that some teachers do, never get. The more affable that you tend to be, mm -hmm. okay, the less likely you would have problems with young people. Because now, what is aff what's the definition of affable? Well, be, uh, being congenial, being, uh, you know, friendly, easygoing, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, charming even. Mm -hmm. See, they don't, a lot of adults don't feel the need to charm young people. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. And yet... The Pied Piper did it. Look, he, you know, he he let him off. He let him off, and they never saw the kids again, right? And by the, and, and, but, but, but let me tell you, you know, so many parents. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could have been the Pied Piper. I could have. Well, I mean, that's what a lot of religious, you know, they're very charming. So then people just start believing. Yes, them. and that's but, that's. But we don't need to get into that crazy religion. Well, I, oh, that's another. That's <laughs> another whole podcast. All I'm saying yeah, to you yeah. is the following. I yeah. think that um, uh, the the confidence that is made obvious by the spazzatura of the instructor mm -hmm. helps to engender confidence in the young people in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I learned, uh, we have a few more minutes, I think, but what I learned 
again, listening to young people, listening to students, not, you learn a lot. For example, I mm -hmm. was teaching, again, teaching English, mm -hmm. and it wasn't, we didn't have an AP English class in uh, Central High School for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I was asked, the, they, oh, this is another story. I was, they asked 21 people in the department, who would like to teach advanced placement English? We need to have an advanced placement course in this district. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to do it. Really? Except, except what year was what year was this? Oh God, I re can't remember. It was way back. Way mm. back. I think well, I think it may have even been sometime in the seventies, but I don't even I don't, I'm not mm. sure. Okay. Maybe early eighties. Good, but we went. I mean, I was there a long time. We didn't have, have an AP English class. We mm. had my honors world of class. Yeah. Which was, but I had said to the principal when we finally did it that anyone who took my honors world of class, well, they'd have to take both if they wanted to take AP, which yeah. would be an elective. Okay. They had to take both because in, 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 in honors world literature, I was going to sp be specific about serious literature. Mm -hmm. In AP, I could do more things about uh, uh, structure of language, you know, mm -hmm. rhetoric, uh, writing, composition, yeah. mm -hmm. grammar, more arcane kinds yeah. of things. Yeah, yeah. So, and he said, okay, great. Okay. So that's what we did. So he was good that way. That was, I'll have to tell you who, that was Don Meehan. I give him a lot of credit. Mm, yes, I um, remember. Philosophically and personally, we were sometimes on the other ends of the spectrum, but he gave me great, great uh, respect and trust in terms of doing certain things. Uh, that's after, great. You had yeah. the support there. Yeah, I have to say, you know, and um, which was great because you need that. You sometimes don't get that from administrators, but he yeah. gave it to me, for which I am. If he ever hears about this, I am forever grateful to him for that. You know. Anyway, so uh, but this confidence about what I what I would hear from students taking, let's say, uh, AP classes in other disciplines, mm -hmm. because I think they had I had I think they had a fifth one in physics and chemistry. I think they had it history. I forget which ones they had, but English didn't have it. And I remember kids coming in from I don't want to tell you which discipline it was, but they, but they were coming in from this one class and this one teacher. And it was getting, and they had, you remember, they had to pay for the a, the AP exam at the time. It was like 75 bucks. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And a lot of kids didn't have the money. And they said, well, you know, and these were great. These were outstanding students. Uh, so I, and they said, well, I'm not going to take the exam. And they're talking to each other. Yeah, I'm not going to take it either. And then would, when I listen, would listen to them, they saying, well, I don't think I know enough. I don't really feel that I can qualify in this exam. Okay. Because they used to rate it five being the top and then down to one, which was, you didn't qualify, two didn't qualify, five was highly qualified, four was qualified, three was, or four was well qualified, and then three was just qualified. Mm -hmm. So, but they wouldn't take it, they wouldn't want to spend the money, because they didn't feel, and this is the key, they didn't feel confident enough to take it. They didn't feel that their knowledge base was com confident. Mm -hmm. They knew mm -hmm. confident enough to take it. Mm -hmm. And so one of the first things I realized when I accepted to the AP exam, to do the AP course was my biggest job, if I had good students coming into the program, was to develop their confidence mm -hmm. in their own belief that they could achieve success on that exam. Yeah, you see? it's all about their perception. Well, it's, yeah, the, the perception of, but the, in other words, lots of teachers believe that they have to like a like a marine sergeant, they got to break yeah. these kids down to yeah. the-, the that's, uh, that's the majority of teachers. Well, you know, I don't want to speak for all of them, but I will that's, say this. That's how I, feel. I yeah. feel like it's the majority of Well, teachers. and I, I don't, I'm not heartily disagreeing with you at all, mm -hmm. but I didn't feel the need to, to break them down. I felt the need to, to build them up, build them up. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And, and because what I was hearing from young people, not, they weren't talking to me directly. I was, again, over, like I overheard the girl saying, oh, he never gave worksheets. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's time. That's time consuming. It's crap. We've been worksheets. The kids it's mostly crap. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, it, teachers can do less, and the kids they're doing stuff that's you know it's like rote learning, and no, that's not that's not what I do. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but but building up of confidence the, is the key to all of this. Yeah. Okay. And that means you have to interact in the classroom, and, and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there was something else I was going to mention about that. Uh, oh, well, the other thing about why teachers don't want to teach certain courses like ad advanced placement. Mm -hmm. Advanced placement ha gives a national exam. Yeah. And the New York State Regents is a state exam. Mm -hmm. Lots of teachers didn't want to have to teach Regents exams because you know what? 
if their students didn't do well, they felt it would reflect poorly on them as, as teachers, as instructors, yeah. Yeah. okay? So they didn't want their reputation to go, go south if their students were failing the, the English regions, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with AP, you know, as if you had all these students taking AP courses and, and uh, you know, they weren't making it, uh, you know, that's probably not good for your reputation for a lot yeah. of people. Mm -hmm. Me, uh, because I like a challenge, I did it because I said, oh, I like a challenge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it also meant, selfishly, uh, I wouldn't have to teach another ninth grade non-regions class. <laughs> so oh, I, okay. I like, I like teaching, <laughs> I was, yeah, I like teaching the, the seniors and the juniors. Yeah. So I like teaching mm -hmm. kids who had some aspirations toward uh, intellectual and academic su success. Yeah. And I had more to say to them. Mm -hmm. Having said they would that, understand it. And yeah, but having to... said that, I used mm -hmm. to say this to the principal. And I did it trepidatiously because I didn't want him to make me teach all five, five classes of non-regional kids. I said, however, the best teachers in the building should be teaching the worst students in the building. Because the best teachers in the building had the skills, the personalities, mm -hmm. the knowledge base bases mm -hmm. to really, really do something with those kids. Mm -hmm. And if they had the personality skills, yeah. so they, could, they could lift up those kids. And I know so the best the best teachers should teach the worst students. Yeah, but the best teachers, you know, selfishly, mm -hmm. and I'm one of them. Yeah, I would look. It's much easier for me to teach academically motivated students who mm -hmm. are seventh, yeah sixteenth and nineteenth. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. as opposed to teaching kids like I taught nine reasons classes. Guess what? Ninth grade. You know, you know what their reading levels was? The average reading level for a ninth grade class in those wow. days. Fourth grade. Oh, really? And they were in the ninth grade. Oh. Okay. Okay. Uh, fourth grade was average. If you were lucky, I used to have kids who are reading on an eighth, gra uh, eighth grade level in a ninth grade re non reasons class. Yeah, yeah. They were like valedictorians in that class because oh, wow. they were so, f they were pretty much close to par. Yeah. Levels, so. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. But I mean, so there are things that uh, I always wanted to be able to engender to cook in this all. I wanted when I was teaching at the universities to, because remember I taught at Stony Brook on and off for 17 years. I would say Joseph, was at St. Joseph's, which is now a university for two years. Mm -hmm. I was actually a, a downstate seminar teacher for uh, New Paul's for mm -hmm. well over a decade because they mm -hmm. needed somebody down here to yeah. have, to observe student teachers for them. Certain students couldn't do their student teaching upstate or wherever they were. For yeah. whatever reasons, so I did that. So was that I was I also did a, a, a semester or two at New uh, New York Tech. Mm -hmm. So I was at a lot of different schools, you know, as I was you know, looking around for you know, I was adjuncting and stuff, and I had time I had time to kill, so I had you know, and but the whole idea was to uh, it, again it engender a sense of confidence confidence in them and to make them understand that you know what as 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 beginning teachers. Yeah, you have to know your stuff. Yeah, you got to fill out the paperwork. You got to meet the deadlines. That's all true. But when you are dealing with the young people, you got to remember, you're st while you're still close enough in their ages, mm -hmm. you need to remember what it was like for you. Yeah. You 17 or 18. Yeah, exactly. I think that's what teachers forget is that you have to remember how you were and what teachers you liked and what they did. And so I think this is yeah. like a beautiful podcast and very informative and helpful for teachers to come. Well, yeah, I, I, I do miss uh, espousing these kinds of things to aspiring teachers because I think my feeling was that I wanted young people, uh, to, you know, like high school kids, to have better teachers than they have been used to getting. Yeah, yeah, so, I totally If I agree. could help it, if I, not that I was the best teacher ever, but you know what, if I could help it, help people, help. Yeah, and this is what you're doing now with the podcast is helping those people too, you know, to get the message out. So that's why I appreciate it. And so thank you very much for joining me here today. Always a pleasure, Ms. Chung. Always a pleasure. You, you know, maybe, but I have to say, if I was really a good teacher, maybe I would have instilled in you the notion that maybe you shouldn't color your hair pink, you know? <laughs> what are you talking my hair is so cute pink i do i think in fact i think you look absolutely not only i think i look but, stunning i think you look adorable i really do <laughs> in fact i don't know maybe i should now wait a second how about since i've got silver hair how about maybe i dye my hair pink maybe we could do a podcast i got pink i'll have pink hair so will you 
Come you could, you could, and it's it's temporary, so it washes out. Oh really? Oh, I yeah. don't even do that. Yeah, remind so me, this washes out. Remind me about the time I wanted to get uh, a fake thing of dreadlocks when I was teaching African American literature. Oh my god, you have to say it here, like add it in. I, want, I wanted to get like uh, gray hair dreadlocks. So yeah. When I would come out of the class, go into class to teach African American literature, I'd have these dreadlocks and they would be gray. <laughs> That's so funny. Well, you can get fake ones. Get That's what I'm ones. saying. And I hat. never, I never got around to it. I never got around. To oh, it. so like a I, fake gray one with a hat, and then you just put it over yourself. That's right. I thought. I think my students would have really, really. I think that would have been really hysterical. That would have been. I, I, no. I, I, by the way, uh, last note. I, I loved teaching African American literature. My black students at the time, all my students of color, not just mm -hmm. black. They gave me, much to my pleasant surprise, mm -hmm. they gave me a huge amount of respect, but more importantly, to the point where I, sometimes when I talk about it, I get weepy. They gave me humongous gobs of affection. Yeah, well, I'm glad that they were open-minded also to accept you as their teacher, you know what I mean? Because it's really hard. Yeah, they were great. <clears throat> it was a great experience. Okay, I've said enough. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you so much. All right, Bye -bye. take care, babe. Right, bye now. Bye.